People did it because they had to. I didn't know my heredity. Maybe we don't have those girls or contract. They're always called girls. People did it. Oh, that means your mother was a whore. Because they're all guilty. Yes, it was. So what difference does it make? From shame. Protection from shame. The biggest obstacle to us is our culture's uh, discrimination against bastards and our invisibility. Being an adoptee, there's a, a loneliness, a feeling of incomplete that those of you that aren't adopted, just you don't have any means of understanding. People never let adoptees grow up. We're perennially referred to as adopted children. The point is respecting people's rights to decide whether or not they have a relationship with somebody. Look, it's not about reunion, it's about our civil rights. The only new information that the birth certificate will give that is not accessible through, third, through the registries is my name. 58 is one-sided. It gives the child the right, but it doesn't give the birth parents the right. You know, the way the system works now is not working. I will fully agree with that. I don't believe ballot measure 58 is the answer, though. We're not saying that the idea of Measure 58 is bad. We're saying that Measure 58 itself is bad. There's no right that's more important here. We're at simply asking for the same right that all other adult citizens are extended, and that is the right to access a personal document called the Original Birth Certificate. Helen Hill was raised with her brother Sebastian in a large house in Kansas City, Missouri. Helen's father, Salvatore Patti, was a successful contractor, her mother Betty a homemaker. They were your typical Midwestern family in the 1950s. And like most families, the Pattys kept their family secrets silent. Helen was an unusually curious child, and one day her curiosity led her to the family's large library. It was here she discovered her family's biggest secret. Everybody was wonderful and decent to each other, but we led very distant lives. It was a very, very lonely place, and I'd find myself wandering the hallways ever since I was a little kid, wondering about something. I couldn't figure out what, but I was looking, always looking, looking in drawers, looking. I didn't even know what I was looking for. I was a little bit scared to find anything somehow, too. But I grew taller one year. It was like, 11, 12 years old. I grew a little bit taller. And I was in our library. I see this book up there that I had never noticed before. And I bring it, you know, I brought it down and I read it. And I knew right then that that's what I'd been looking for. And I went cold as ice. But it said the ad adopted family on it. The adopted family. Boom. I knew. I wasn't their kid. I, I knew it in my cells. I knew it like I'd always known it, but I'd never really known it. So I, I uh, had to know for sure, though, because there was still a little voice saying, well, maybe, maybe it's just a book that's here. You know? Like, these people were strangers that lied to me, and I was a stranger, and my body was a strange body. Where did it come from? And it's just kind of like the floor fell away from me. And my brother, who's this stranger that had grown up with? So I went back in their room there and my dad's watching TV and my mom's sitting in her chair knitting as she did every single night with the lamp over her head and I don't even know where I got the courage but I said what's this book on adoption doing in the library and she says you're adopted you knew that we told you now go to bed <laughs> 20 years after Helen found that book in the family library Salvatore Patti discovered that he, too, was adopted. In his 60s and devastated by his own parents' deception, Salvatore never did find any information about his birth parents. He died a few months later. In 1996, Helen was a 42-year-old art teacher and mother of three living on the Oregon coast. Helen realized that she wanted to find her birth mother. Because Missouri was a closed record state, Helen discovered that in order to find any information, she would have to employ the services of an underground network of adoption searchers. Thanks to a significant inheritance left by Salvatore, Helen was able to afford the large fees demanded by the searchers. One day I got a call from the people that had been searching for me that said simply they found her. And then I had to pay 
uh, wire money before they would tell me if she was even dead or alive. Because a lot of times if they fine for you and the person's dead, then the person doesn't want to pay the money. So they don't tell you that. So, I mean, it was a, it was a, a remarkable day. Finally, the call came about 10 o'clock that night after the wire transfer had gone through and all that, that, um, yes, she was alive and living in Des Moines and she had five children and she was a Jungian art psychotherapist and she went to Albuquerque, you know, all this stuff about her was pretty overwhelming and they gave me her phone number. Well, it was too late to call that night. And, uh, boy, I, I went to sleep. I mean, my dreams were incredible. So I knew that the next day I was going to be speaking to my mother. From the intermediary's information, Helen discovered that she was born March 24, 1955, at the Fairmont Maternity Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. She learned that her mother's name at the time of her birth was Jane Hill, a name that Helen would legally take as her own in 1997. She came on the line. She had the sweetest voice I've ever heard. I mean, truly. And I asked her if she had some uh, privacy because I had something personal I wanted to speak with her about. She said yes. And then I, I had this written out beforehand because I didn't think I'd be able to remember what my name was at this point in time. And I was really glad I had some, this written out. I just had a sentence and it was, my name is Helen and I was born on March 24th at Fairmont Hospital. And after a pause of, I don't know, how long, but she said, I love you. And I can't even tell you what else we talked about. I think that it was a brief conversation and it was awkward even. But those three words were um, everything I needed <laughs> at night. After that first contact, mother and daughter spoke again on the phone and finally arranged for a meeting at Jane's home in Iowa. It was not a happy event that happened between the two of us, me and my mother. And it was very, very difficult for both of us. There's so much threading through and trying to figure out, and, and so much hurt on everybody's side that, yeah, you, you kind of get plunged into um, a roller coaster ride. And it's wonderful, and I never trade it for anything in the world because I'm a different human being than, than I was two years ago before I found her. Jane needed to keep a lot of distance between us. She, uh, um, she didn't really want to talk. My, some of my main questions were questions that she couldn't touch with a 10-foot pole, like, did you touch me? Did you see me? Did I see you? Did we look at each other? She couldn't tell me any of that. I suppose I needed an answer to those questions so that, so that I could be born in a way. Reluctantly, Jane gave Helen the name of her birth father. Helen located Albert Anella in New Mexico. They met, and Helen immediately saw her face in his. Although the relationship with her birth parents proved to be strained and ultimately short-lived, Helen was thankful for the opportunity to finally meet them. It was this opportunity that sparked what would become the most publicized battles for open records in America to date, Oregon's Ballot Measure 58. I just felt really indebted and full of gratitude for res the resolution and the reconciliation in my own mind and heart. Not because I got to meet my birth mom, but um, because I'd had the opportunity to resolve a whole bunch of stuff, uh, empty stuff in my, in my inside, and I couldn't, I couldn't just rest with that until I did something to help other people do that too. Bastard Nation um, is an interesting group. It's, uh, I came into contact with them about a year ago, and before then I think that my thoughts and my energies were pretty unfocused. I knew I was pissed off, but I didn't really know why. It's the first place where adoptees were really got together at, as a large group. I first heard the name Bastard Nation at an ORA meeting, that's an Oregon Adoptive Rights Association meeting in Portland, and somebody mentioned, man, I, I stumbled onto this Bastard Nation site, and it is hilarious. And I just immediately, I liked the irreverence of it, and I liked the name, and uh, I thought, well, I've got to check this out. I really like the idea of using the word bastard as an empowerment rather than a, you know, a degradation. They were people who were not mainstream. You know, I'm not talking about AOL users where everything was very easy for them, but um, very intelligent, very kind of libertarian-oriented people, and that's how I find the bastards to be. So Bastard Nation was at that point just a collection of, of adoptees with an idea. 
with that with an argument and they use the website to put forth that argument. In the case of Bastard Nation, we, our mission is twofold. One, the legislative, which is to ensure that all adult adoptees have equal access to their original birth certificate. It's basically that they have equal access to government documents that every other adult citizen has access to. And on the other is to provide a forum. It's uh, f for all adoptees on the diversity of the adoptee experience. Uh, the International Soundex Reunion Registry sponsors an event every year where they do outreach and put uh, flyers out that you can fill out. So I went to the, Calif uh, to the San Francisco table and I met uh, Denise Castellucci and Deb Schwartz and saw literature on their table for an organization called Bastard Nation. And I looked at it and I just said, that's for me that really encapsulated where I was, being an adoptee. I came in as just somebody who happened to search and find and be able to get to trace my, my roots to the 1700s, yet they wouldn't give me my birth certificate. It is the technological revolution of the Internet which has enabled adoptees to get together and to exchange experiences and to educate each other and those concerned with adoption and the public about adoptee issues. Most of the available literature about adoptees as adults that I had come across was very much therapeutic uh, based on uh, psychological models of victimhood, uh, which were true in their way, but they weren't very empowering. It's not about reunion, it's about our civil rights. There was this group of people who um, had been frust either had been frustrated in their lives in their searches or had never found, and they got political. And the only reason they were able to do that is because they were all together on the net. So um, the timing was very important. I didn't, I didn't want to identify myself as a victim. I didn't feel like a victim. I felt pissed off. And Bastard Nation were a bunch of pissed off adoptees. <laughs> Helen joined the Bastards at their annual convention in Chicago. We're in downtown Chicago. My brother's a circuit court judge who just got elected to the bench. He's in the Daly Building, which is right there. I'm like looking up and going, oh my God, please don't let Sebastian be looking down going, that's my crazy kid sister with this, what is this cult she's in, Bastard Nation? Yeah, I was terribly self-conscious, but I remember marching around that circle, fighting myself really embarrassed, really worried that my brother, that I was going to embarrass him or ruin his career. And I remember thinking to myself, what the hell are you doing here, Helen? Either you march like you mean it or you get out of the freaking circle. She was getting a lot of her buttons pushed by identifying as a bastard. Uh, all of her adoptee issues were just like right in front of her. I, she confessed to me at the convention. She didn't know where to run into our waiting arms or run a, as far away from us as possible. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, when we left the convention, I didn't know whether we'd see Helen again, you know, because it was such a hot button for her emotionally. I got up early that morning because I wanted a front row seat to listen to Randy Shaw. And he'd said a lot of stuff that was really cool. He was, he was a wonderful pick. I mean, what, those guys were brilliant to pick him because he's like all about grassroots political activism. And he really loved the organization. He thought it had a great name. It had a great presence on the net. It had great potential. And so uh, he gave us a lot of great ideas. And, and he gave me the big one, man. It, it was literally like a light bulb went off in my head. Well, yeah, I could do that. I really could do that in Oregon. Maybe the only state in the whole nation where you could accomplish this for less than a quarter of a million dollars too and I knew I knew we could do it so when Helen returned to Oregon she began regular email correspondence with Bastard Nation and began writing the ballot initiative that would be known first as measure 46 then measure 58 I went home and I talked it over with my kids because I had um, at the time I had an 18 year old and a 16 year old and a 11-year-old. 
So I wanted to say, look, I might get involved with something, and for the first time in your life, your mom might not be home for dinner. She might not be home with cookies coming out of the oven like I always been for their whole life. And I wanted them to know that I could get involved in something that I really believed in, but that might take me away from home in the next couple of years more than I'd like to be, but that I would take them with me whenever I could. And I'd be home, you know, a lot, but, but it would be a big deal. It would have a big impact on our family. While researching the history of Oregon's adoption laws, Helen learned that birth records were originally open to all citizens. Oregon then followed other states, which began sealing the birth records of adoptees in the 1930s. Lawmakers at the time believed that being born out of wedlock was so stigmatizing that adopted children deserved new identities. Following some brief discussion, the 1957 legislature simply crossed out wording in the law which had always, up to that point, allowed adoptees at the age of consent access to their original birth certificates. The simple deletion of a few words forever and retroactively sealed original birth certificates from adult adoptees. In order to get on the ballot, Measure 58 would need 73,261 signatures, and more importantly, signature gatherers. In the early stages of the signature drive, Helen held on to hopes of keeping the effort a small grassroots campaign. So she traveled throughout the state, naming regional coordinators and training volunteers. So wear your button proudly. I'm a volunteer circulator. Hi, I'm Helen Hill, Chief Petitioner of Proposed Ballot Measure 46, which will give adoptees the right to request and receive a copy of their original birth certificates when they're 21 years of age, just like any other citizen of Oregon. This is a volunteer effort and we need signatures. If you'd like to help circulate petitions, please call 503-368-5786. Got records? He does. I'll see you on the sidewalk. Thank you. My main objective for tonight was to get people to sign up for this weekend to the Auto Show and also the Rolling Stones concert to get signatures. Um, I haven't gotten really any calls back as far as volunteering, so... It's a twofold objective right now. Qualifying for the ballot um, and also getting it, which means getting the signatures, but also getting the, the state to understand the issue. It's it's a, uh, in our case, it's a question of education as much, and enlightenment as much as anything. Hi, I'm Helen Hill, Chief Petitioner for Proposed Ballot Measure 46. The which only issue with Measure 46 is that it's got, it doesn't go anywhere else. That's it. It's a civil rights initiative. We want to be treated the same way as every other citizen. Um, we want to be able to... Um, walk in and get our original birth certificates. And we want to hit, hit the Oregon public with that, that, that. That is what this is. And if they don't understand that, it's our job. We're not going to sit around and, you know, November 4th and go, they didn't get it. If they didn't get it, it's our fault. <laughs> This isn't about money or taxes, this is about matters of the heart. What county are you in? Yeah, no. You're rocking around the Christmas tree, have a happy holiday, have happy. Everyone dancing merrily in the new old fashioned way. In late January of 1998, just two months into the signature drive, Helen began to realize how daunting a task it would be to gather more than 70,000 signatures with only a handful of willing volunteers. Concerning the, uh, the measure, what are you, uh, you thinking about right now? Like, honestly? 
or do you want a bunch of shit? If you want a bunch of shit, I, I tell you that um, we're really, really looking forward to exploding here, that we kind of held off over the holidays, ever since Thanksgiving, really, um, knowing that the holidays would kind of sap people's energy, and we were waiting for the first of the year to really swing into the full signature gathering drive. And uh, if I was full of shit, I'd tell you that I'm really excited about that and looking forward to... Uh, but if I was to be really honest, I would have to say that I'm terrified <laughs> and I'm overwhelmed and uh, the prospect of 100,000 signatures is kind of daunting. The prospect, you know, there's certain realities have begun to hit home, which is that this is going to cost a lot of money. And um, it's sort of like with any effort, I, I suppose, any effort that is important and that's really going to affect some serious change, there comes a time where you realize just how much of you it's going to take. And, and that's a terrifying moment, but <laughs> one that has to come so you can really do the work needed. So I've been understanding that lately. And all the insecurities that come with it, you know, and wondering if I'm going to be up to it, if I'm going to fail, um, and knowing that I can't fail, I won't fail. The Bastards recognized the importance of Helen's effort and saw it as the perfect opportunity to put Bastard Nation into the national consciousness. Also, as public policy issues in Western states tend to mirror neighboring states, if they could succeed with open records in Oregon, then the rest of the West would soon follow. On the agenda for today's meeting, uh, I figured we would discuss Oregon first, since that's sort of the most pressing issue. And essentially, what, what, we're, what, what Bastard Nation as a whole is about, and the Oregon petition as well, is about um, giving, giving adoptees the same access to this, to the basic information in search of those answers that every other adopt, that every other human being has. I had to wait for people to come out of the woodwork that I could be sure were going to be totally focused on the civil rights angle and not get all lost in medical or search and reunion stuff. Totally understanding that and, and able to verbalize that eloquently. Bastard Nation has no opinion on anything but the open records for adult adoptees, uh, you know, the uncensored, you know, uh, you know, unamended birth certificate, being able to get that access to the birth certificate. Helen brought the measure to a meeting of the Oregon Adoptive Rights Association, or ORA, in hopes of gaining their support. Uh, the ORA was formed in 1979, and it's a nonprofit organization, and our main focus is on education, legislative reform, search health, and support, and so that's what we do here. The ORA is very typical of the old guard of adoption, or adoptees' rights. They're very, they're, very, they're support orient, oriented, they're search and reunion oriented, they're warm fuzzy. Um, it is like a big support group with some practical aspects to it. You know, here's, here's how you get your non-identifying information from the state, here's how you register with the state. Um, maybe your birth mom has, been, has registered too, you get a lot of tips. But it's also, it's also a support group. It has very much what Bastard Nation calls the tissue box mentality. This is what the Attorney General wrote and worded it, and it's going to appear just this on the back with a check mark, yes or no. And uh, Oregon voters can check on yes or no. That's better. Yeah. yeah. She is. That, first time she to, me, to me, people vote like they're signing a contract. Yeah. Helen wanted to work with Aura more than Bastard Nation wanted her to. They, they didn't trust Aura. Um, they didn't like the name. There were birth mothers. There was a birth mother at Aura, I think, who had been raped, and she was very uncomfortable with Measure 58. And there was also a very strong feeling, um, since birth mothers are a part of Aura, that if you're going to open the, the birth records to adoptees, why not birth mothers? There's a lot of resentment on the other side. My main concern is with the rape victims. See, I don't know what the other situations are, but. Um, Nobody could possibly understand what those issues are unless you have walked through the situation. And I don't mean just a rape issue, but rape and relinquishment. So it was a tenuous relationship. And then there is Dolores Teller, 
who is a very strong leader for her group and a very good spokesperson. And I would imagine that most women that signed it were thinking, oh, gee, don't tell my boss or my mother or my grandparents that I'm pregnant. Not, please don't let my son come and find me. That's that evolution was very interesting. At first, the bastards did not like it. And when I say the bastards, I mean basically Shea Grimm, Julie Dennis, um, the West Coast leaders of Bastard Nation, and Helen. Um, they didn't trust Dolores Teller. She seemed like a real camera hog. She had a very, um, I hesitate to say weird, but she had an unusual personal story that she reunited with her birth son and, and then re -adop and adopted him. So he was adopted twice, once by his adoptive parents and his, his birth mother, um, which is an adoptive parent's worst nightmare, that the birth mother is going to come in and take your kid away from you. Um, but he had a very bad relationship with his adoptive parents. And as an adult, he went back to his birth mother. So they, they didn't want her to be out in the media telling her personal story. Um, they didn't trust her. As it turns out, I think Dolores turned out to be a very good spokesman for the measure. She got it. Um, and with some backslides, I think, um, carried the tune. I can see a point where um, I might be kind of obsolete because there's a lot of people that are driven by, um, by they like limelight and notoriety and all. I went through a, a time about a week ago where I thought I was going to have to kill myself. I really did because I got two different people telling me. Uh, one a legal assistant, one an attorney telling me that the law that I had written the proposed law, as it appears on the petition, is full of shit, won't hold itself up in court, that, you know, what did I think I was trying to do here? It's not written. Did I, did I go to see a legislative attorney on the matter? And I'm going, oh my God, what have I done? I'm just a simple person and I've made a grievous error, a fatal error, <laughs> and I'm going to have to tell these 250 people now working on this all over the state that, um, sorry, I made a boo-boo. All the signatures we've gathered are worthless. We have to throw the start all over again. If we can bear that thought, which is three months process of going through the Secretary of State's office again for a, a new measure number and a new ballot title, yada, yada, yada. So I went through a time there where I thought I was going to have to jump off a cliff. I would really like to just lead in a quiet, sort of behind the scenes sort of way. Thank you to all of you who are doing this effort. We want our children, our birth daughters, our birth sons to be treated with respect, with dignity, and with equality. In 1957, someone in Oregon decided that the circumstances of the birth of this state's adopted citizens needed to be hid from them. For nearly 40 years, the adopted population of Oregon has lived in a state which treats them as second-class citizens. I could not access my original birth certificate and therefore could not claim my true identity. Had we known that they would have been treated like second-class citizens, maybe we would have fought harder when it came to relinquishment. I just want to make it clear that what we're asking for is a right that should have never been taken away. You absolutely have the right and always should have had the right to know about your heritage. A free state is formed and maintained by a union of citizens governed under the same body of laws. I am not an infant. Are any of the adoptees here infants and children? No! Are any of the birth mothers here 16-year-old girls? No! No. We hold down jobs, we vote, and we pay taxes. But we can't go, as an adult adoptee, I can't go to the county in the state of Washington and ask for my original birth certificate. And that's wrong. Kansas has open records. Alaska has open records.
psychologically, it's, it's really hard to get, even though we have the manpower, it's really hard to get 200 adoptees and birth moms out there on the streets talking about an issue that's, that's so vulnerable to them. I mean, I'm pretty t tough and thick-skinned, but to have somebody come up to you and say, they gave you away for a reason. What are you, uh, what are you nosing around for? You got no right. You know, somebody said that to me, and boy, it was a while. It was a little while before I recovered. You know, I um, I was spending all my weekends, hours and hours and hours, working on getting signatures, and the most you can get is like 50 a day. You know, and it was just it was the numbers weren't adding up, and plus with this issue. Everybody has to tell you a story, and it's a fascinating story, and it's a heartfelt story. But you, all you do all day long is listen to stories. So that it was exhausting. Sometime in March or April, after after something like five solid months of work, we had three thousand <laughs> signatures, and uh, it was a joke. We have gone to paid circulators. That's been like a real monkey off our back. We've, um, but then in, again, we've entered this sort of strange, seamy, underworld-like world of paid circulators. They were characters. I wish you'd have been there the, the final turn in, man. We had three loaded guns hidden. What turn in? The final turn in, where we had um, over 50,000 signatures came in. And we were up all night, and, and it was, we, we called in everything off the street. And it was in Donna's little apartment, and she was having people come stay and sleep with her because, sleep on her couch so that they'd have a P.O. box so that they could be legal petitioners. They're all street kids. The final hand in is there's a lot of tension because there's a lot of money changing hands. I mean, literally thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. And these guys bring guns, and you gotta have a gun. Donna had a gun, loaded handgun in her drawer. If anything gets out of hand, because if they don't, they traditionally get totally ripped off. Politics is like that. On July 9, 1998, Helen and her supporters turned in the signatures to the Secretary of State. Measure 58 was the first initiative of 1998 to turn in the required number of signatures and was the first measure to qualify for the ballot. We're turning in our signatures, 86,422. I'm exhausted. You have to excuse me. I can't remember when I slept more than four hours, but it's good. We're happy. You know, so many initiatives get filed initially, and then you never hear another word about them. People get mad at thing, about something and file an initiative, and this Every appearance was that this was one of those, and I never expected it to get this far because I didn't know at that time that there was someone like Helen Hill who was going to pump seventy, ninety-five thousand dollars in to uh, pay for signature gathering. Um, so I was very surprised in July when the Secretary of State's office announced that the. Uh, petition had been filed and the signatures apparently were there. Hey guys, we did it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Having successfully put Measure 58 on the ballot, the real fight was just beginning. In the early stages, supporters were faced with only having to convince registered voters to sign a petition. Now they would be asking Oregon voters to make the measure law. And unlike their earlier efforts, there would now be vocal opposition to the initiative. We're going to be out there, visible, at every chance, educating people about it. There are some things that everyone should have a right to know, such as when, where, and to whom we were born. These are some of the thousands of Oregonians who are denied access to their original birth certificate by current Oregon law. Measure 58 would restore the right of adopted adults to access their original birth certificate if they choose. This November, vote yes on Measure 58. Do you ever wonder who you are? I do all the time. Vote yes on Measure 58. The Measure's media campaign included putting a face to the issue.
One face that would soon become synonymous with Measure 58 was 51-year-old Curtis Endicott. Although his adoptive parents were always open about his being adopted, in the closed record system of Oregon, there was little information about his birth parents that they could tell him. My son's 28 years old, and just recently he had to have a kidney transplant. Well, very fortunately, his mother, still alive, was compatible. Now, had she not been compatible, where could we have gone for a donor? When I go to the doctor, <coughs> excuse me, the doctor says, do you have any history of, and I have to answer the doctor, I don't know. I'm adopted. There's never been a copy of a birth certificate I've ever seen that has medical information on it. Um, so if people use the argument that they're going for medical information, one, they're not going to get it just from getting that copy of that, that document. They're going to get it if they contact the birth parent and find out. Um, second thing about medical information is the state of Oregon does have that stuff on file. Um, you know, I don't know exactly about independent adoptions when it went through private attorneys, but I know through agencies they do have that on file. And I went to Good Samaritan Hospital in Portland and they said, oh, the records have been destroyed. Or They always tell you that. You know, they always tell you that. That's what they told me in Ontario, too, Nelson. Uh, don't go back that far, they've been destroyed. 76-year-old Mary Enselman found out that she was adopted when she was 72 years old. Although she received the original release form from the Boys and Girls Aid Society, it did not include any medical information about her birth parents. She is hoping that the original birth certificate may hold some clues to her family history. All my life, I've gone on, you go to the doctor and they ask, do you have cancer in the family and all that? And we've always put down, mother had cancer, she had diabetes. Well, I've gone through that on tests all the time. My kids are going through that. My grandkids are going through that. My great-grandkids are going through that. All false statement. And they should have a right. The fundamental driving force behind opposition to Measure 58 is protection of privacy. That's what it's all about, really, is the privacy of birth mothers who were rape victims, the privacy of birth mothers who built a life around not disclosing uh, what happened to them when they were younger. And in some cases, the privacy of adoptees removed from abusive families with which they don't want to reconnect. How do you defend your privacy when disclosing your interest to the news media reveals your secret. Well, Warren came out against this measure. He is an adoptive father of, I want to say, two daughters, and they're in their teens. And um, he's, he was very much against this measure and citing over and over again birth mother privacy. But then as the conversation would go on, it was very clear that his fears as an adoptive father were, you know, we're not foster parents. These are our children. Why would they need to meet someone who doesn't have anything to do with their life anymore? Being an adoptee, there's a, a loneliness, a feeling of incomplete that those of you that aren't adopted just you don't have any means of understanding. It's one of those you had to be there situations. The more this has gone on, the more that I've thought about it, the more it means to me to be able to find a blood relative. It's not something that I gave a whole lot of thought to prior to this. The medical history was my main concern in getting involved with this. But as time has passed, it's become more and more important to me to actually find blood relatives whether that be my birth mother, uh, father, or just a sibling. It, uh, it'll be nice. When you read this ballot measure, you're like, wow, yeah, of course, these people should have this information. But you don't think about the other people that are affected by it. Um, you know, adoption is unique. There's, there's these people involved. There's the person that has the child. There's the person that's been born and the person who raises this child. There's, you know, there's no situation in the world like it. And you have to make sure that all three parties are being protected, so. If I sign a form requesting confidential services, or I sign a form that says that I understand that this information will be held in the strictest confidence unless you have my permission to release it, which is standard in any kind of counseling relationship, that happens. Then I have every reason to expect that that is a promise that the agency is making me and that they will uphold. I have the right to tell the vinyl siding salesman to leave me alone. 
before he contacts me, before he's done anything. But I don't have the right to tell somebody whose appearance could be extremely traumatic and could destroy my life, whether they mean to or not. I don't have the right to tell them I'd rather they not call me. Uh, as an adult, don't I have a right to know who I am? I believe I do. A lot of people ask me, well, why do you want your birth certificate? And I'm like, because it's mine. You know, it shouldn't, I, I shouldn't have to explain myself. They make it very difficult um, to be reasonable. Um, and they, they force a choosing sides kind of a position when it doesn't have to be that way. Um, and I'm not going to say anything else because I don't want to get sued. <laughs> Maybe it's time to just say, to take our lessons from uh, Martin Luther King and Malcolm X and all those other guys and just say, there can be no compromise when you're talking about civil rights. I don't get it. It's so irrelevant to the measure. Cindy has longed for her daughter for 20 years since she held a tiny girl in her arms, kissed her goodbye, and left the maternity center in a state far from Oregon. <laughs> and I always told him where I was. A few months ago, when her daughter reached a legal age to search in the state where she was relinquished, Cindy had papers notarized. And the end of the state. Cindy was on her own for the first time in her life, a college student, naive and way too trusty. Wanted to be a stranger. She got raped. There are some cases where open adoption doesn't work and reunion is inappropriate. And the most extreme cases are fairly obvious. On the birth parent side, it is the birth mother who is a victim of rape, sacrificed part of her life to have the child, but is not a suitable parent for that child and knows she's not, knows that when she sees that child, she's going to see the rapist. Adoptees are asking to know who's my mom, but parents who gave up their children want to stay anonymous. Debating Ballot Measure 58, that's tonight on Town Hall. Can you hear us? Yes, I can. First of all, you're obviously uh, having your voice disguised and you're in shadows there. That says something in and of itself. Why is it you want to remain anonymous in this? Uh, Mark, I'm a rape victim. It was a, a violent stranger rape. And I, um, the father was convicted, and so his whereabouts are available to my birth daughter that I gave up for adoption. I recently made a match with her. The adoption was in a different state. And I thought that when I, when I contacted her that she would understand, but instead she wants to find her father. And I don't want her to have identifying information about me. I don't think that should be available to her. It scares me. Why does it scare you? Because I'm afraid he might um, harbor resentment towards me for putting him in jail, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And I don't want him to come hurt my family. I don't want him to have emotional contact with me in any way, shape, or form so that he can intimidate me any further. Ask me again what I would say to the rape victim, please. Mm -hmm. What would you say to Cindy and right. others like her? That's uh, a good question. I might get it. Yeah. Uh, boy, what do you say to her? Um, you had so you went through something that nobody should have ever, ever gone through. This is something that, that few women endured. It's a horrible crime. It's something that we need to have a lot of compassion for. Cindy endured far more than she should have. Um, rape is a is a painful issue for both the adoptee and the birth mother. The rape was the crime, however, and not the birth of the child. To further punish both you and your child by treating your daughter differently from all other citizens and removing a fundamental right to access your own information, that's a wrong too. Good. Okay. Yeah. Okay. My experience was to go with my daughter just literally everywhere, or she came with me as we went to places. And so you know, I got to see and, and to come to to these meetings and see the horrendous, powerful drive that there are in these kids to find out who they are. She's the product of a rape. And uh, she knows, yeah. And uh, the mother was looking for her. So, but I, 
it's, it's, it's really powerful. And you know, you, if you try to have an exclusion the way the bureaucracy works, there's this exclusion and they add these exclusions and then pretty quick the law isn't the law. I don't think it's good for the child to know that half of their genetic makeup comes from the rapist. Okay, it's, it's best, some things are best unknown. It doesn't matter what the truth is, the truth is the truth and we can accept that. Some people don't want to accept that. All of us, whether their situation is as serious as mine or not, we all have stories and I believe our feelings need to be honored. When she gives up that child for adoption, certainly I think is an innocent victim who has a right to get on with her life uh, as free as possible of this memory and as free as possible of the evidence. To further stigmatize and punish the victims of this crime by treating them differently from all other citizens, by sealing up the true record of their birth is both unconstitutional and unjust. Why is this a bad idea? Well, we see um, probably about um, 4,000 pregnant women a year. And uh, numerous ones of them do choose adoption. And I, uh, you know, open and closed both. And, um, you know, we are, as a nation, as a society, we're for a woman's right to choose. Mm -hmm. And uh, if we're going to apply that rule consistently, we need to allow those women who want to choose adoption to make that choice. And if they want to um, put the past behind them, um, they need that freedom. And I fear, well, I know that if they don't, that some of them will choose abortion. And they will be pushed into it. I'm sure of it because I know of the women that have made choices and we hear from them. You do hear this undercurrent in this campaign for this, that if a woman knows that she may be discovered and found later on, she's more inclined to abort her child rather than put it up for adoption. You disagree? I'm a, I'm a birth mother. and. I didn't tell my parents until it was too late because I knew they'd force me into an adopt or an abortion. Um, so what you're saying is, is absolutely incorrect. It's not supported by this, the facts for the open states of Kansas and Alaska who actually have lower abortion rates than any of the surrounding states that have closed records. So your statement is totally wrong. Totally wrong. And in the movie, Secrets and Lies, that you just showed us a, a clip of, uh, they did open uh, birth certificates to adoptees in, I believe, 1973. And the abortion statistics stayed absolutely the same. That's something that you can check. No effect on abortion rates. Abortion is not an issue here? No. No, no. It's not. no. absolutely not. Mr. Reed, rebuttal. I, I haven't seen the movie, and I hear your stats, but I'm telling you that these young clients come in, maybe a different generation than you. These clients come in, and many of them say, you know, Adoption, I couldn't just give my baby away, and they choose abortion. I'm telling you, it happens. Mm -hmm. Okay. Adoption is a choose, is a, I'm sorry, go, go ahead. Go ahead, Helen. Hill. There's two different, uh, two wholly different ideas going on here. Abortion is a woman's decision not to go through with a pregnancy. Adoption is a woman's decision not to go through with parenting. They're two very separate decisions a woman makes. I'm going to go meet my sister for the first time. I talked to her for the first time in my life a couple days ago. Well, about four or five days ago. My sister, uh, my mother's daughter. My mother that I found last year. My mother had, after she had me, she had five other children that she kept and has a really close, loving family. And, but Becky was the one that left. So I never got to meet her. Our mother um, said that we're very much alike, so I'm looking forward to meeting her. 
My mom called me up. We were in Mesa at that time, and she said, um, there's something I need to tell you. Um, and she just made it real short, straightforward. She said that she had had a child before she was married to my dad. And it was a complete and total shock. I had had no idea that, um, that this had happened. I had really no hint of it, no mention of it, the whole time that I've known my mom, over 30 years. So it was a surprise. I feel really close to her. I, f I feel close to all of them. Even, even if I never met her, I'd feel close to her. I'm hoping for a connection, OK? That's bottom line. Sometimes you make one, sometimes you don't. But you come away with it being a lot, a lot fuller of a person, I think. A lot bigger <laughs> to meet these people. All my life, I felt like I felt like I was a big sister somehow. I mean, that's a that's a hard concept to try to describe. But but I felt like there were people somewhere in the world that I was absolutely devoted to and loved very much. It's been a driving search my entire life to find these people. And, um, and the thing that I remember my family telling me the most was that Helen was a lot like me. That she looked like me, that her and I were, were very similar, and that we would get along real well. White crew cut. Oh, yeah. White crew cut. Yeah. He had about three chins. I remember playing <laughs> with him when I was a little kid. Did he always have white hair? Like no, he, I think he had brown hair when he was young, but they adopted me when they were in their 40s. So, so he probably was, always seemed like they were pretty old. Yeah. How long ago did he die? About 10, 12 years. No, about 10 years. Yes, my mother called me and said, I lost him. Mm -hmm. oh, I felt so bad for her because they were just so together. You know? mm -hmm. so I flew right down to be with her. She was in California. Mm -hmm. He died really easily. He, he um, just came in from working outside with flowers and came in and sat down in the chair. And my mother said she heard a noise, an odd noise, like something got, I don't know what it sounds like when you have a heart attack. She went in there and he was gone. I mean, in wow. minutes. I think because she was trying to tell me, I really am a good mother. Yes, I gave you away, but I am a good mother. See, she had the, and, and it kept breaking my heart. Um, and she, how could she know that? But she kept telling me whenever I called, and I don't call anymore, really. I, but she would just tell me how wonderful her other children were, and this is what so and so's doing, and Bruce is getting married, and, and he's this and he's that. And I mean, I was thrilled to know all these things, but still, it was, it was like I was still outside looking in, and, and the door was still shut. And maybe I was responsible for shutting that door, too, because I really didn't know how to be in that family, and it was so foreign to me and so terrifying. But. Maybe in the back of my head, I, I think that I might have a chance to actually be a part of Becky's life and, and vice versa. She has three children. She's a single mom like me. She came out here looking for serenity. The same way I, I made a, my own epic journey away from home and family to find some serenity too. You know, one of the neatest things about it is that I like her so much. I like the person that she is the way that she treats myself and my children. I just like her and I told her that if we hadn't been sisters, I would have chosen her as a friend. This is very rare. I want you to know that. <laughs> but uh, yeah, he uh, got tangled up in some wire here in the barn. Maybe that perhaps is a consequence of uh, Doing a statewide ballot measure. Well, I was going to ask you about this. Yeah, you start digging.
Measure 58 at its core is addressing a really tragic thing that happened in people's lives. For a lot of people, it's not like passing the bottle bill, okay? It's addressing a tragedy that happened. So you can't just be, you can't separate a civil rights battle with your own sad issues at the core of all of it. <laughs> what a coincidence. Does that mean that I can sue or that she can sue or that she can sue? That's not true. She can an aneurysm waiting to happen. That's what I'm feeling like. It definitely is just the beginning. We've changed, uh, we've altered the national discourse uh, and adopted civil rights. I think regardless of what happens, we've turned the tide. Oh, that's uh, Can't do anything more.
It has been exciting and a lot of fun. So people left, sure they left. People probably went home to get, um, to be private with the victory and wonder what the hell that meant for them. And I think that all of us probably had an inkling, I know I did, that there was going to be a hell of a court battle. Immediately following the election, Marion County Circuit Court Judge Albin Norblad granted an injunction halting the implementation of Measure 58 as a result of a lawsuit filed by Franklin Hunsaker. Hunsaker, a Portland attorney and adoptive father, filed the lawsuit on behalf of six anonymous birth mothers. Well, the idea today is to stir up some public outrage uh, surrounding the injunction which the opposition has been able to obtain, um, prohibiting adoptees in Oregon from getting the birth certificates, even though nearly 60% of the population voted to allow them to do so. The birth certificates of all Oregon adoptees were sealed in 1957, when the stigma of unwed motherhood was much worse than it is today. But many of those young women didn't understand that their confidentiality could be eliminated by a change in the law. Just before that change was to take effect, however, Portland attorney Franklin Hunsaker filed a lawsuit on behalf of six birth mothers. He says unsealing of birth certificates violates their constitutional rights to privacy. I'm not against reunions between adult adoptees and birth parents if those reunions are based on mutual consent. And I think it's unfair to tell a birth mother who made a life-changing decision many years ago that the promises and assurances of confidentiality and privacy that were made to her are now going to be breached. Uh, we're, we're welcome to be inside. I think as a group, we should lay down our signs uh, at 1 o'clock and everybody walk upstairs to room 205 and form a long line. Anybody that wants to apply for their birth certificate, I encourage you to do so today. It won't be processed until the injunction is lifted, but uh, I have every optimistic hope that that injunction will be lifted, and so does the Attorney General's office. They believe that it's a constitutional law that was passed by the voters of Oregon. Yeah. 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 Well, we're encouraging people to go ahead and apply because the Bureau of Vital Records has stated that they're going to queue the applications and then once the injunction is lifted, um, they'll process them in order. So it, it is important that people go ahead and file. 51-year-old Curtis Endicott of St. Helens has been waiting decades to meet his birth mother, who he says has nothing to fear from contact. The first words that I would like to say to my birth mother is thank you very much for carrying me to a live birth and, and making such a sacrifice. Then I'll get into asking what the circumstances were and so forth. The Oregon legislature has amended the law so that any birth mother may request a tag be affixed to the birth certificate that says she prefers not to be contacted. Adoption rights activists who champion the law say they will put similar measures before voters in other states across the nation. For NPR News, I'm Nancy Solomon in Eugene, Oregon. Yeah. <laughs> no, we're not. We're going to be peaceful and cordial and just uh, um, any adoptee that wants to apply, I encourage you to so, do it. Let's all go on up there. I'm feeling good. Feeling good. But you uh, wish you could have got to your to down. Down. That would have been nice. I've been waiting 50 years, well, okay. almost 50 years it seems, so another couple of months isn't going to seem that long. <laughs> yes. On September 11th, 1999, supporters of Measure 58 suffered their biggest loss. Spokesman, supporter, and friend Curtis Endicott died in his home of heart failure the result of a lifelong, undiagnosed lung ailment. Um, I got a call early one morning, not too long after the appeals court decision, that um, it was Bobby. She's just this tiny little scared voice saying, oh, you've lost your number one PR guy. She said something like that, and I just knew exactly what happened. I just, um, but 
His health started really deteriorating. He was one of the interveners in the court case. Um, it was Curtis and me and Aura. Um, and his health started getting really bad, and I started getting really worried about him. And I know he was just depressed as hell about the, the continued injunctions. They made no sense to him. I mean, he, he was Joe Oregon. He didn't understand why when people vote for something, and a lower court judge says, this is totally constitutional, and then the appeals court said, this is totally constitutional, why Hunziker was still able to get injunctions. It looked at one point like the injunctions were going to literally go on forever. And I think he, it broke his spirit. I know it did. Nobody wanted to know worse than Curtis. But nobody was more moral about it than Curtis. He was not going to pay $450 to some state-appointed searcher to go make first contact for him. I mean, he, he wanted his birth certificate. God damn it. And he wanted to search himself. I mean, he was, he was a great man. And I'll tell you something funny, though. Curtis had an amazing sense of humor. He was always joking around. And for several weeks after he died, I could hear his voice. I've never had this experience with a dead person. But, but I could hear him. I mean, I would talk to him say, Curtis, what are we supposed to do without you now? And he would say, you know, OK, Helen, call the Oregonian. Get an article about me. I love to be in the papers, you know that. Get an article about me, tell him I died. And, and so I did, I, would, I was doing things kind of like I could hear him talking to me and making jokes about stuff. And he was one of the first people to get his birth certificate. And um, Bobby found his birth mother right away. And this woman wanted to meet him so bad to, and she was just hoping Measure 58 would pass. And she'd seen him on television. And she was brokenhearted to find out he had just died. It was at that point that I, I did experience feelings of hatred for Hunziker. Because there he is talking about how we're going to damage the lives of our birth mothers. Here's my buddy dead. And this, this whole resolution that could have happened for him lost. On January 5th, 2000, Measure 58 supporters converged in front of Hunsaker's office to protest his seemingly unending injunctions. The quiet victory of the 1998 elections was a distant memory. It would take another four months and a decision from the Supreme Court for a conclusion to the legal battle. Yes, the court, the state, the people say yes. The court, the state, the people say yes. I mean, what is it like to have this? I mean, were you expecting something, or what, what do you, what's your reaction to this? It's been an emotional roller coaster for this cause, for one thing, and uh, we really thought that, you know, I'm, I, we haven't held a protest before now because we really believe that this should work itself through the court system, and everybody should have their day in court. But the opposition has gone on record saying that they, um, they don't think that they have a chance here, but their strategy is to stall the law, and that's wasting the time and resources of the good people of the world. We're trying to get this passed, hopefully, in the near future, the Supreme Court will uphold the law, and that will be the end of him. There'll be no more bullshit. I see you. Curtis is here with you. Yes, he's always with me. Always. The people said yes. The courts, the states, the people said yes. The courts, the states, the people said yes. The courts, the states. The Supreme Court of the United States has refused to stand in the way of an Oregon law which permits adult adoptees to get copies of their birth records. Since the Supreme Court has refused to grant a delay, the law goes into effect this evening. You know what's fascinating is I got lots of death threats and hate mail before and during the litigation, but since it's been in effect, I haven't received any. What does that tell you? <laughs> Nobody's been writing me a letter saying, you've ruined, you ruined my life. I knew you would, and look what you... I mean, nothing. There hasn't been one birth mother who's filed harassment charges or there hasn't been any, nobody's been able to uncover any stories about 
any life being ruined or a woman getting fired from her job or whatever. All of the weird things they said would happen. I feel finally like at the age of 45, I have finally done something where I feel worthwhile. I, have, I haven't saved any lives, but I might have. There might be some people getting their birth certificates that might die of something if they didn't. I, there's just a lot of reconciliations, and it's not me that did it. There's just a whole mess of people that did it. And I also have this funny feeling that, that it was just this, this niche that, that I was walking along and I just fell into, and we were able to get something finally done. But I do personally have a feeling of tremendous sense of like, thank God, thank God I didn't chicken out because it, it keeps on giving to my life and it keeps on, um, I, feel, I feel like I can hold up my head. I'm proud and I, I, didn't, I never had that feeling before. I hold you close to me Memory, a little by.